This lecture is about complementary sleep assessment tests. It is intended for the Neurophysiology Fellows at Niklaus Children's Hospital. This talk is about multiple sleep latency test, a test indicated for patients with suspected narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia and we will also talk about maintenance of wakefulness test. This test is indicated for the assessment of individual in whom the ability to remain awake constitute a safety issue or in patients with narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersonia to assess response to treatment with medications. This talk will be conducted in a conversational format. I will start by talking about multiple sleep latency tests. The purpose of the multiple sleep latency tests is twofold. to determine the number of trials with REM sleep and to establish the mean sleep latency. It is wise on patients undergoing an MSLT to perform a polysomnogram the night before to document at least six hours of a sleep. This is especially so in patients with suspected narcolepsy. Sleep diary kept for two weeks before testing is a good idea and if possible, medication that interfere with the sleep should be stopped for about a week before the test is done. The test, that is the MSLT, consists of giving the patient four opportunities to nap and to add one more, the fifth trial, if one of the first four trials have shown a REM sleep epoch. The first trial should be conducted about two hours after getting up in the morning. Other trials should be carried out at about two hours interval from the initiation of the prior nap. This frame has a figure corresponding to an MSLT presented by Ms. Colette Navin from the University Hospital of South Manchester. As we mentioned, the first trial will be conducted about two hours after waking up in the morning. Then the second trial, then the third trial, and the fourth trial. The inter-trial period should be about one and a half hours that is from the end of a trial to the beginning of the next trial or about two hours if we measure the time from the beginning of a trial to the beginning of the following trial. Here in the upper right corner you have what is labeled the sleep profile section. W indicates wake, R for REM, and below the non-REM stages. The actual derivations most commonly used 
are those presented in this study and pointed by the arrow. The electrode should obviously be placed prior to starting the trials. The arrow points to rapid eye movement that are present in this frame. Notice that the stage in this epoch is marked by the letter R, indicating that this epoch is REM stage sleep. The arrow now is pointing to the first trial, which I have just highlighted in green square and enlarged in this frame. Trial consists of an initial and very important step, which is providing the patient with a set of instructions. These instructions are to refrain from caffeine and alcohol during the day of the study, avoid smoking 30 minutes prior to each nap, avoid vigorous activity during the day, avoid falling asleep in between the naps, avoid laying down between naps, it is allowed for the patient to move or to walk about if he's feeling sleepy. To avoid bright lights and direct sunlight. The patient will be allowed to have breakfast and lunch, but should be taken at least one hour prior to the next nap. Once the instructions are provided, calibration should be done. The calibrations are performed by asking the patient to do different maneuvers or different actions. He's asked to clench jaws, to move eyes in all directions and to blink and to swallow. After calibrations are completed and they are technically up to standards, the patient is instructed to go to sleep and the lights are turned off. The patient is expected to attempt to go to sleep. The room should be quiet interruption should be avoided. In this case, the trial was stopped at the point indicated by the arrow. Trials are terminated for different reasons. If no sleep occurs in 20 minutes, the trial is stopped. In this situation, the sleep latency is tabulated as 20 minutes. The trial is also stopped if the patient has been asleep for 15 minutes. If the patient falls asleep but wakes up after 20 minutes of the onset of the trial, or as soon as the first REM epoch appears. A REM epoch is an epoch in which 50% of the activity is considered to be REM stage. Another indication to stop the trial is if there is too much environmental noise in the room, in which case the trial should be restarted as soon as the, no the environmental noise is corrected, if possible. If not possible, then the, the test should be postponed for a and for another day. Once the trial is terminated, 
we look at the results of the first trial. We're especially interested in clinically relevant information, which are sleep onset latency, which is measured from lights off to first obvious sleep stage, and REM latency, which is calculated from the onset of the first sleep stage to REM, not from light out to REM. So in this trial, that is in trial one, sleep latency was 20 seconds and REM was present. The actual latency to REM is interesting but not used clinically. The only clinically relevant information regarding REM is whether it happens or it does not happen. Then we look at the second trial here indicated by the arrow. No calibration is done at this trial. The patient is simply asked to try to sleep and the trial will be terminated using the same termination rule that we use for the first trial and that we have, have just described. Again, once the trial end, ends, we look at the result of the second trial. We notice the sleep latency and whether REM sleep is present or not. So in this second trial, sleep latency was 92 seconds and REM sleep was present. The same is done with the third trial. Sleep latency was 24 seconds and REM sleep was present. Then we do the same for a fourth time, that is the fourth trial. In this trial, sleep latency was 33 seconds and REM sleep was present. A fifth trial should only be conducted if one of the trials shows REM sleep. So in a multiple sleep latency test, the number of trials with REM sleep that must be present in order for us to call it abnormal is two or more trials. But it is important to stress that not all patients with narcolepsy have positive MSLT, only 80% of them do, and that not all patients with positive MSLT have narcolepsy. The MSLT test, in addition to providing information regarding the number of trials with REM sleep, it also provides for calculating the mean sleep latency. Calculating mean sleep latency consists of subtracting from a sleep onset time, the light out time for each trial. If no sleep occurs during the trial, then the latency is tabulated to be 20 minutes. Sleep latency needs to be calculated for all trials. This is done by adding all the sleep latencies and dividing them by the number of trials. The normal value is usually more than eight minutes. 
but mean sleep latency varies significantly in normal patients, depending on the number of trials. As you can see in this frame, to your right in green, you see two columns. When four naps are conducted in control patient, the mean is 10.4, whereas if five naps are tabulated, then the mean is 11.6. So as you can see, the last nap heavily contributes to increasing the mean sleep latency on MSLTs when it is conducted. You can also see in this figure that patients with narcolepsy have a very low sleep latency, that is 3.1. Patients with idiopathic hypersomnia have 6.2, and those with obstructive sleep apnea have 7.2. In this new frame uh, that I'm showing you, you can see that there is a significant amount of difference between mean sleep latency tests among those that take four naps and those that take five naps, and that this difference varies with age. At 40 years of age, the difference is not that big, whereas at 30 years of age, the difference is very significant. So mean sleep latency to be considered abnormal must be 8 minutes or less. This concludes our discussion about MSLT and now we're going to talk briefly about maintenance of wakefulness test. The maintenance of wakefulness test measures the voluntary ability to stay awake under conditions that favor falling asleep. The test procedure is the same as the MSLT. The only difference is that the patient is asked to sit upright and not to lay down. The patient should sit in bed with the back and the head supported. The patient is then instructed to sit still and remain awake for as long as possible to look directly ahead and do not look directly at the light and not to use strenuous physical action to stay awake such as singing, talking or moving around. The test should be ended if no sleep occurs within 40 minutes of lights out in which case we tabulate sleep latency to be 40 minutes. If unequivocal sleep appears, that is, if three consecutive epochs of a stage one sleep appears or one epoch of any other stage of a sleep appears. The trial is also ended if unavoidable noise or external disruptions occur in cannot be stopped. If they can be stopped, then we restart a new trial as soon as possible. But we have to make sure that in the report, the fact that we had to stop the trial is noted. The normal mean sleep latency estimated using maintenance of wakefulness tests is about 30 minutes, but in some normal people, a mean sleep latency of 19 minutes is often encountered. So in order to be safe, we refer to excessive sleepiness 
only in the cases where the mean sleep latency, as estimated by the maintenance of wakefulness tests, is 15 minutes or less. Thank you very much for your attention.